Hello and welcome to this lesson of Mastering Java. Here we're going to cover the static keyword and try to give you a flavor and a good feeling for what that keyword is. Previous lesson we talked about public versus private. We made that pretty clear by explaining what it is and doing a couple quick little examples in the code here. Here we're going to do the same thing for the static keyword. Um, so notice we have our, the same code that we had pretty much in the last section. Uh, we have our aircraft class. I went ahead and left in the method to set passengers. And so that set passengers variable is now private. We talked about that before. We're creating two objects here with a constructor to, to populate everything there. And then we just call some methods, print some things out. And then we have this leftover from the last section where we set that private variable. All right, the bottom line is, uh, let's talk about variables first. When a variable is set to static in Java, it means a couple of things. I'll tell you what they are. You'll probably scratch your head. And then whenever we, I show you, then you'll understand a little more. When it's set to static, two things pretty much happen. The first thing is that that variable, let's say I do static, static integer cruise speed. Notice how it highlights, it goes to italics there. That means that this variable cruise speed can be interfaced with without even declaring an object. I'll say that again, it's weird. You can put things into the cruise speed variable now once it's listed as static even before I create an object. So that's really really weird when you think about it for a second because um, you know we, we kept saying that hey all these member variables they're part of the class and when we create a new aircraft object then the the Cessna 172 then has a passengers variable, cruise speed variable, fuel capacity variable and a burn rate variable. So now I'm telling you if, you, if you tag it as static, then this variable is something that can be interfaced with and used um, even before you create an object. And the reason that it can do that is because of the second part of what the static, uh, the static uh, word means, in my opinion. And that is that basically it kind of behaves as a global variable. A global variable is something that would apply to all aircraft. For instance, we know that all aircraft are going to have um, passenger count and we all know that they're all going to be different numbers of passengers right some aircraft are going to have two passengers and some of them have four and so on we know that all aircraft are going to have different fuel speeds we know that they're all going to have different fuel capacities we know that they're all going to have a different fuel burn rate all right but we also know that for instance if I wanted to make my database more complete um, how many wings do you think a Cessna 172 would have it's going to have two wings how many wings do you think a Piper Saratoga is going to have? It's going to have two wings. How many wings do you have? A jumbo? Do you think a jumbo jet or a, a you know Boeing jet or an Airbus jet or any of those giant airplanes? They're all going to have two wings. So if you have variables that are going to apply to every single type of aircraft that you would ever use this for, then it might might make sense for you to call it static int wings. Right? So now we've added another member variable called wings, and when we put the static keyword, notice how it turns it italics. If I take that away, notice the italic goes away. All right. So static means, the reason it's called static, what do you think the word static means? If something is static, it means it's non-moving, right? So in this context, when something is static, it really means that it's unchanging, sort of. It's something that, that it's a loose, it's a loose, um, it's a, it's a loose analogy, but basically what it means is the variable wings is going to basically apply to all objects that we would create here. So for instance, I could say, um, and because it applies to all objects, here's another very important thing, you would, you would set it this way. Instead of Cessna172.wings, you would set it as aircraft, which is the name of the class.wings. Notice how it's listed right there. And I can set that equal to two. And then I could go here and I could say system.out.println. And I could come here and I could say all of my aircraft have, and I could say aircraft wings, wings, like this. And let's save this and run it. All of my aircraft have two wings. So what's happening here is there's a couple of very, very important things for you to realize. When it's listed as static, you interface with it by calling the class name dot wings. The reason you do that is because when something is declared static, it's basically going to apply to all um, uh, all of the objects you create. So for instance, if I say system.out.println, let's do it this way. Let me show you this. So we'll do um, Cessna 
172.wings, right? And then underneath it, let's go to system.out.println. Let's go to Piper Saratoga dot wings dot wings like this. So basically we're printing the, the number of wings for the Cessna and the number of wings for the Piper. And we're going to get the same number, two. Now if I change this one variable here, let's pretend for a second I had four wings on uh, all of aircraft in existence, then everything would change to four. So that's why I mean when I say the wings variable, which is part of this class, it behaves kind of like a global variable for all possible aircraft that we would ever use in our database. So let me change it back to two. So in other words, all of the objects that we create of aircraft class, they're going to have a wings variable present, right? But that wings variable is going to be the same for all objects you create. So it's almost like there's a master copy of the wings variable that's kind of set aside. That's why it's italicized. It's kind of set aside in, in, um, in terms of, of the class definition. So whenever you put static there, Java says, okay, there's, a, there's an aircraft class and this one is static. So we're gonna put a variable called wings in that, in that class. And the value of wings is going to apply to all objects in the class. So what you really have here is a situation where you have a variable that you know is going to apply to all of your objects. The best way to interface it and to set that variable is by referencing the class name dot and then the variable and setting it equal to whatever it is. And this value is then going to ripple through and apply to all objects that you have uh, basically instantiated. So here we have a Cessna object and a Piper object. The wings variable that's associated with each of those objects is going to have the same value. It's kind of like a global variable. If you change it once, you change it everywhere. All right, that's the most important thing. The other thing is the static, when something is uh, defined as being static, you can actually interface and use it even before the object is created. So let me go ahead and kill that, take it out of this location. All right. Notice I'll paste it in up here, up above where I've declared my two aircraft objects. Usually you would never be able to do that um, because when you can't interface with an object variable before the object created, right? But in this case, everything works just fine because this is a static, uh, a static uh, variable. So when it's static, you can access the variable uh, by means that we're talking about here, where instead of the object name, you put the class name dot variable name. You can interface with those variables even before any objects are created because they're behaving as global variables and they're going to ripple through and they're going to basically apply to any objects that you create of that class. Now you might say, well, other than this contrived example of aircraft and wings, when would I ever, ever possibly need to do static on a, on a, on a variable? Well, like I said before, you know, usually you're not going to use it, but there will be cases in which it will be useful and that will come with experience. When you're coding a project and you get that experience and you're, you're getting into the level where you think you might need that, you'll know when you might need something uh, declared as static or not. I can give you one quick example though, uh, because the static keyword not only applies to variables, it applies to methods as well. So for instance, I can make this static uh, here. This uh, particular guy I could make that static if I want to. Now notice Java is complaining here, it's underlining some stuff, and that's because these variables here in the class, the fuel capacity and the fuel burn rate, they're not static variables. So if I'm going to do that, I would have to put static variable there and then static variable there in order for this method to work, as I've said. But basically what, what, what that means is if I put static in both of those variable locations, I could set a fuel capacity. If, for instance, all of my aircraft are going to have the same fuel capacity, I could set that as a global variable. I could set the burn rate. If all of my aircraft are going to have the same burn rate, I could set that um, before any objects are created. And then since I've got this method assigned as static, I can actually calculate the endurance even before any objects are created. That's what the static keyword allows me to do. It's a little bit of a contrived uh, example. Let me show you what a better example would be. Something that I think everybody here watching this will be able to wrap their brain around and say, oh, I understand that. Now, if you remember, in the last volume of Mastering Java, we covered the math class. We covered how to take square roots and cube roots and sine and cosine and trigonometric functions and things like that. And we explored the math class quite a bit. In fact, we said something like, um, 
math dot if you do that you can see all of the methods and you know here, here you have pi you have arc cosine these are all methods here um, that are part of the math class so let's say for instance we're going to do cosine right so let me double click that so now that you know a little bit about classes I can put a number in here 5.56 for instance let's do something like that all right what this is doing is it's taking the cosine of the number 5.56 right but when you think about it if you think for just a second for me math is not an object math is a class it's a class definition right but somehow we're accessing a method inside of the math class even though we haven't created any objects you know it's really all self-consistent here in this aircraft business we've been doing we, we made an aircraft class and then we had to create some objects and then after we created some objects we could access the variables and the methods and use them but here we have a math class we haven't created any objects um, you know so how are we able to use the method that's inside of the math class even though we haven't created any objects the answer is this method in here is tagged as static so that means that I can use this method even if there's no objects created and that's the main reason why you would use static or one of the main reasons if you had kind of a global method that you wanted anybody in your program to really be able to use you don't anticipate really needing any to create any objects or have the overhead of creating any objects to access those methods then you would just put static there and static allows you to use that guy without any uh, without any other objects being created or without any objects of t uh, in the math class being instantiated and that's why so that's kind of a more grounded reason why I, I don't think you're going to be using static uh, static keyword too often but I wanted to give a uh, lesson for you here so at least you understand what it is these these keywords like public private and static um, they uh, they they're hard to wrap your brain around at first in Java because you have to have some understanding of methods objects and classes in Java to even uh, understand what that stuff means so you're you're studying you know basic code and you see all of these extra keywords and you're like what does this mean you know now because we've learned you know void and we've learned static and we've learned public now you can kind of understand where some of the stuff is coming from I don't expect you to be a fluent in this yet I mean it takes practice with programming to get to that point but these types of things and these types of exercise sizes step by step is really what brings it home for you so that's going to conclude the, conclude this set of lessons in uh, mastering Java. We've learned a tremendous amount of material. You know, at the beginning of this set of lessons, you didn't even know what a method was. You know, which is a, a subroutine to calculate something or to perform a function of some kind. But now you know all about methods and return types, parameters. If we're going to you know use them in our calculations, we've learned about classes and member variables, member methods. We've learned about public and private and static keywords and access modifiers and we've learned you know a whole awful lot about what you might actually use a class for in Java to create these objects that um, can simplify our programming basically object-oriented programming is all about taking general classes of things creating templates uh, of them which we call a class and then we just create an instance of that which we we call creating an object to operate on them and so we can reduce our code overhead if we see see that we can create a class of something then instead of doing it over and over and over and over again every time we want to use something we'll just create the class one time and then we can just instantiate a copy of it anytime we want to use it somewhere so I encourage you to look at all of these lessons and the sum total of where we've been where we've gone where we where we're going and do all of the exercises and I, I really encourage you to really make sure you understand everything uh, as well as you can because all of these concepts are really uh, really uh, form the foundation of object-oriented programming not only in Java but in most programming languages that are object-oriented these ideas of of objects and classes and methods and things they may have different names in another language but they're basically the same thing so if you understand this then going on to C++ or another object-oriented language is gonna be much much easier so I, I suggest you take the time work the examples yourself um, Get, get your editor up, start playing around with some code, and uh, the only way that you can really learn this stuff is by doing it yourself. So I encourage you to do that, play around with it, get creative, and have fun programming in Java.